Right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Dr. Joe Blanin, and I'm the courses leader for the Master of Teaching program here at Monash University in the Faculty of Education. Um, we've got about um, an hour and a bit program this evening uh, with time set aside at the end for questions. Um, I have my colleagues Patrick and Jen here with me who are excellent at answering questions. So this in this webinar mode of Zoom, you will see that you have a Q&A button on your menu um, and that's where you're invited to post your questions. I probably myself won't be able to see um, any particular um, hands up or um, other interactions, but um, you can get through to Patrick and Jen very easily. This evening, we're also very excited to have Maya with us, who is an alumni of the program. And later on, we're going to hear from her about her experiences um, as a student in the Master of Teaching program. As we begin, I would like to um, begin by acknowledging the lands on which we speak today. So we're all located in different um, places, and I'd like you to take a moment to um, acknowledge the lands on which you stand particularly. Um, and we recognize that sovereignty was never ceded. And specifically, I acknowledge that the Wurundjeri and Boomerang people, who are communities of the Kulin Nation, are the ongoing custodians of the lands on which Monash University and our different um, campuses here in Victoria now stand. And we pay our respects to um, that history and that culture um, and all of those people through our teaching and learning. We pay that respect to Wurundjeri and Bunurong elders and their past, present, future communities and any members of those um, communities that are here with us this evening. So welcome everyone. So um, First off, if you've just jumped in, we've had another kind of few people join. Again, my name is uh, Joe Blanin. I'm the courses leader for the Master of Teaching. Um, and my email address is there and you will um, have access to that afterwards as well. So um, while I don't manage enrollment um, or validation of previous qualifications, if you have program questions about the um, program that are specific to yourself that you don't think are relevant to this group setting this evening, you're very welcome to email me and I can put you in touch um, if I can't answer the questions myself. So what we need to think about is um, why Monash? And we're very proud of our education programs and our initial teacher education, so ITE programs. Um, we are currently ranked number one in Australia and we are top 14 in the world, which means we're ranked up there with Harvard, um, Oxford and a number of other very high, highly regarded institutions around the world. It's a highly competitive space and we're always very proud to, to note that we have been acknowledged and recognized in this way. So we are the, the top performing ITE, Initial Teacher Education Provider in Australia. We do provide an undergraduate program, which is four years, but tonight we're here to talk about the Master of Teaching. Um, we're gonna talk about what to expect in a Master of Teaching program, some key information that you'll need to make your decision about your next steps, entry requirements and how to how to apply. We're gonna then hear from uh, Maya, our fabulous alumnus, and then we'll have time at the end for questions. So I'm gonna ask Patrick and Jen, if there's any point at which you think I need to stop and answer a question, feel free to jump in and let me know. Otherwise I'll just keep trucking. So what to expect? So you're becoming a teacher or thinking about becoming a teacher. It is joining a profession. It is like um, joining um, the law or um, becoming an accountant or becoming um, a doctor or anything in the medical field. It is a profession and a profession is um, defined by having regulatory bodies, which we have um, in Victoria and nationally in Australia. It's defined by ongoing learning and it's defined by ongoing um, interactions within the profession to improve what we do. And so those are some key things to think about. Um, teaching is a uh, a very exciting. I, I've taught in four countries in three languages, everything from three year olds up to 99 year olds. Um, I've taught in um, outdoor education, running um, adventure, wilderness adventure camps, um, and every situation I found exciting and stimulating. There are, um, and in that, on that note, there are a number of ways to. Uh, 
use your education degree, which we'll talk about in a moment. So teaching is not just about becoming a primary or secondary or early childhood teacher. The qualification um, from Monash is internationally recognized. Um, we have a number of alumnus who go back to um, countries where they've previously lived or worked in international schools in countries they'd like to experience. Um, but also in government and large organizations, HR departments, public relations, not-for-profits. Um, you can become a technical writer, some kind of uh, librarian or um, data management or data literacy person, curriculum writing, uh, program writing, outcomes, development, strategic planning. All of these things, all of these pathways are open to you with a qualification in education. Um, so what do teachers do? Well, it may not be um, the same as how you experienced your your teachers when you were at school. So myself, I was in I was in primary school in the 80s and secondary school in the 90s. And the way that schools work now are very, very different. And the role of a teacher is really quite different. Um, and that's something to bear in mind when you're reflecting on your next steps. So teachers ask about 400 questions a day. And you answer about a question a minute per day based on some data that's a couple of years old now, um, but still quite interesting. So the um, the age of the student, the, the type of question changes and you'll, you're likely to get more involved questions and more complex questions with older students and more procedural questions and um, questions about feedback and progress in younger students. But it's a lot of um, interpersonal interaction. Um, teachers on average, and this is across primary and secondary schools, make about 1500 decisions a day. So uh, the traditional view of teaching is that we, um, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, teaching was something where you had a, knowledge, a content knowledge, so you knew how to do something and you stood up and you told people how to do it. And that's quite different to, how, to what teaching is today. Teaching today is about making decisions in the moment. So understanding that there are goals for each child, um, whether they're 15 or five years old, there are individual goals and you are trying to make decisions in the moment about what that child needs next. You will plan for five hours on average of engaging in purposeful and appropriate learning. And that term appropriate is um, increasingly important in what we do because teaching is about understanding the individual needs of every child in every class. So it's not about putting together a PowerPoint and then repeating that PowerPoint over and over. It's about understanding how people learn, what makes sense um, in what context. Um, are you going to try and introduce a brand new Con a new, new concept in a very complicated way the day after students return from a school camp, for example? Or are you going to take on board all of the different needs um, when students return after a school holiday, for example? How are you going to re-engage them? So there's a it's um it's a dynamic and exciting space where you don't repeat a lot of things you do. Um, and so what we do in the Master of Teaching is seek to support you to have the foundational knowledge and theory and understanding of how humans learn, how brains work, how people build knowledge and what knowledge actually is um, and how it makes sense. On top of those more academic um, activities, you're also um, a role model and leader for social skills development. So uh, teaching critical thinking, teaching collaboration, teaching um, community engagement, um, uh, environmental sustainability. All of these things in Australia are part of um, cross-curriculum priorities. So even if you're considering becoming a primary school PE teacher, you will still have responsibilities around critical thinking, problem solving, and even numeracy and literacy. Numeracy and literacy are now recognized skills that every teacher must have. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how that is measured um, in our incoming teachers um, as we go through here. It is a very collaborative profession. Um, I know when I was in school, uh, secondary teachers tended to work very much on their own, even if it was 
For example, a history department in secondary school with three teachers, they taught very differently. That's not how it works these days. So collaboration is a highly significant skill. So you will be working together. And if you think about the fact that you're making 1500 decisions a day and meeting the individual needs of 25 students every time you step into a classroom, you can see why that net, that collaborative approach is absolutely needed. That's how we make sense of things. It's how we reflect on our practice and it's how we meet meet the diverse and changing needs. Um, teaching isn't confined to a classroom or a staff room. It is about the community. It is about parents and families. Um, up to up to and including VCE levels in Victoria, which is 18 year old children, you will be interacting with parents, you'll be providing feedback on how their children are progressing, you'll be um, engaging with them when extra support is needed, or when some significant milestone is achieved, you'll be bringing those parents and families into the classroom into what the students are learning. And so there is um, there is a sense of that community. And of course, um, as you're probably aware, teaching is all about life outside the classroom, too. So there'll be things like yard duty, supervising students at play on recess. There'll be numerous committees, there'll be staff meetings, ongoing professional learning. You might take on the running of a, a club or a sport. You might um, engage in some specialized teaching, which requires you to, to take further study even after your master's. So you might engage in inclusive education or special education or digital technologies or digital literacy. And so it's an ongoing uh, learning space that is really exciting and dynamic um, and particularly um, in this decade it's going to be very highly influenced by technology and artificial intelligence um, um, among other things um, school well-being student well-being and teacher well-being are also highly significant and they will become part of what you learn and what you take with you into classrooms. So we've talked a little bit about this, but there are certain concepts um, and skills that teachers draw on every single day. Uh, communication skills are, are obviously highly important in the majority of jobs uh, that you take on, but in this profession, it is um, the number one skill you need because you need to be able to have flexible and multiple ways of communicating to adults and to children, both what you're intending for them to learn and also to be able to understand what children and parents are saying to you about the complex nature of um, education and child development. So there's a, there's a lot that goes into communication skills. Data analysis and data literacy has become very significant in the last decade and continues to be so, particularly with the rise of um, things like big data and technology, where we can gather data on a huge range of things, not just um, an end of term test. We look at data as informing teaching and learning, uh, which we call formative assessment. So that's the informing. Um, and so asking students what they understand, getting them to demonstrate if they've made a progression in the particular lesson or sequence of lessons, and then being able to analyze that data is highly significant. You need to be open to reflecting um, on your own practice. So we, we talk about metacognitive, so the ability to reflect on your own thinking. And that includes um, a, being able to critique your learning and your performance. So critique in this sense is not the, 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 the use of the term that we see in newspapers, but more the academic understanding that there are multiple shades of um, grey in any kind of space. And so you need to look at your learning and your performance from different perspectives and be able to compare and contrast what you did, how it was received and what might happen next. Um, evaluation of learning and the designing of evaluations of learning is another concept that we, we strongly focus on. Um, planning and creating, it is a creative profession um, in that in meeting the needs of those students individually, as we talked about, you will have to be um, open to accepting creativity and um, and designing exciting, engaging and appropriate learning. And a lot of the times in teaching, we don't hit the mark first time. So you need to be open to failure. So um, 
a lot of the time we say you win some, you learn some. So you either win or you learn. Uh, not really anything to do with failing, but there is an ongoing cycle of self-improvement and learning that you will go through as part of this master's program. How do we do this? Well, we take um, an approach that mirrors how you will work in schools. You will work in tutorials, so small groups of up to about 30 students with, with a, uh, an academic, and you will work on activities that mirror how you will learn and teach in a school. So that will involve group work because as I mentioned, teaching is now a highly collaborative uh, profession. It is something um, that we often need to develop skills in because it is such an intertwined, interactive um, space to be as a professional. So group work is something that you will experience. Um, the majority of tutorials will be interactive and participatory. So this is not the kind of degree where you turn up, you listen to someone talk at you, you write notes and you go home. There, um, we don't offer lectures. We have online recorded lectures that you will be able to review at your leisure as, as a crucial part of your learning. But the face-to-face -face time on campus is, is designed to be everybody engaging and everybody um, having a contribution. So be prepared to come and try new things and make mistakes and try again. We are strongly focused on the practical application of theory. So we're going to talk about theories that, um, that are very well supported by research and literature, although still called theories. Um, and we, we draw on cognitive science um, and cognitive theory as well. So we're going to say, how do we, how do students make sense of numbers over 100, for example? How do they relate the number 100 to the number 99? How do they make that conceptual bridge? And there are theories of learning around how that might work. And then those theories of learning um, inform how you will then teach those ideas. So it's very much um, theory is to inform practice. We have no exams um, in our faculty at all um, because we are trying to mirror, again, what it's like to be in a school. Now, obviously, schools do still run tests and exams, but as a teacher, you will be evaluated each year of your teaching practice through your performance. And so that's what we prepare you for. You might, assessments might ask you to do, uh, to create lesson plans or to teach something and reflect on it, to find resources to meet the needs of a particular scenario or a hypothetical student, to um, create a presentation that you can share with your colleagues at a school. So it's very much focused on that, um, uh, reflection on um, yourself and your preparation for teacher and again mirrors what it would be like in a school. So why study with us? Um, we're, all of these reasons are excellent reasons but we are particularly passionate about initial teacher education, myself included. Um, we are one of the few universities in the country that offers um, specializations such as being able to study to become an early childhood and a primary school teacher within the same course or become a primary and secondary trained teacher within the same course. Every semester in the Masters of Teaching, starting from the very first semester, you will have professional experience, sometimes called placement. Um, you will be in a school um, interacting with children depending on the age range and the course um, you've chosen to enroll in and you will be, excuse me, um, you will be very strongly supported um, by uh, an entire team of um, academics and former school teachers who will be your support person while you are on placement. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the supports that we have in place too. The, the job outlook for teaching is um, for the last few years and shows no signs of stopping is very strong. Um, there are there's a huge demand for teaching uh, teachers, well qualified, highly qualified teachers um, across the country um, and in Victoria itself at the moment, and that's across early childhood, primary, and secondary schools. 
We have a very strong focus, as I mentioned, on student support. That's you, not the children in schools, but on the support of you and your well-being. We, as um, a faculty in a large, um, well-resourced university, can um, we offer you access to all of the university-wide resources, such as um, librarians, psychologists, um, medical centers, um, many, many types of um, writing um, and learning. How do I write this academically? How do I get help on um, editing? All of those things we provide. But we also provide um, ESAs, which are your education success advisor. And that is um, a person who's employed at our faculty who will be your education success advisor for the entire duration of your degree, so for the full two years, and they will help you with things like, um, can I can I take this unit over summer instead of this unit? Can I swap from this tutorial to that tutorial? I've got to go on placement, but I can't get there this day. What do I do? So they are your um, individual continuous connection. So that is uh, a major part of our student support um, network that we provide. When you finish your degree, as I mentioned, it's, um, it's, it's a great time to become a teacher because there is such a demand around the country and in Victoria particularly. Um, so within four months of completing the Monash Master, and remember you, you, finish, you finish it around November, and the school year doesn't start until the following early February. So it's basically uh, that four months is, is the summer period um, when schools aren't in session. So 93.9% of people found employment by the beginning of the following school year. Um, and a lot of people are um, choose to be more flexible. So not all of those are full-time employment. You can see 87.5% went straight into full-time employment, but a lot of people choose to take um, a different route. They might take on some casual relief teaching. They might take on shorter term contracts to try things out, see if they enjoy um, where they are. They might have not decided between primary and secondary teaching, and they might decide to spend some time in both as a casual relief teacher to, to really firm up their decisions. So there, there's a very strong pathway through the master's program and out into the profession. Um, and that's supported by the very strong graduate salary that we have here in Victoria. So when you leave um, the Master of Teaching, you become uh, provisionally registered by the national body, um, which is represented here in Victoria by, the Vic, um, by VIT, which is the Victorian Institute of Teaching. Um, and you will start as a graduate. So that's the graduate level scale. Um, and the graduate salary is set, you can see there in a, in a Department of Education school, uh, private schools and Catholic education schools are slightly different. Um, but you can see that it starts at around 77,000. And if you want to remain in the classroom um, and become what's called a leading teacher, that is you might take on a specialist area across the school, but you still teach in the classroom, or you might become a learning specialist, which means you're hired to again, work in a perhaps a specific area um, with less responsibility than a leading teacher, but with other opportunities to work across the school. So that scale goes up to 125,000 there. And then from there, you can always um, transition into school leadership, which, uh, which is assistant principals and principals here in Victoria. Um, in New South Wales, they're called deputy principals, um, but it, it's a similar kind of structure. So it, it has a strong pathway out into a rewarding profession. So fast facts about the Master of Teaching. We offer programs or courses at two different campuses. So the main campus at Clayton, but also at our Peninsula campus, which is at the end of the Frankston Freeway. It's a gorgeous campus. Um, and depending on how you like to work and how where, where you live, you might choose to uh, take classes at either of those, depending on the course you enroll in. You can either do two years full time or four years part time. We also also offer in the secondary, if you just want to be a secondary school teacher, we offer an accelerated mode, which takes one and a half years yeah, to be qualified. That means that you have classes mid year and over summer. So it is a highly intensive program. 
um, as are the other two. But to try and condense two years into a year and a half, it does mean that you, you don't have those semester breaks in between. The important thing to note that a full time course um, is considered um, to be full time. So classes will be dur um, often during the workday. Um, there may be options at times to have classes out of hours so after five o'clock, um, but it is a full time enrolled course. So consider it as a full time job of, of kind of 40 hours plus um, the additional reading preparation and assessments that you will be working on. It is um, the master of teaching is different to the undergraduate teaching, not just because of the level um, coming in as a master's level. So there's a there's a higher um, threshold for inquiry, depth of thinking, engagement with referencing and resources. But also in the undergraduate program, which is four years full time, you would spend two years learning your specialization. So if you're a secondary school teacher that uh, you want to become a secondary teacher, that might be you spend two years learning about history and then the following two years you spend um, learning how to teach history. And so these are very different concepts. And so in the master of teaching, you do not get to learn the content. You're coming in with an undergraduate degree that has been recognized as having content that maps to the Australian curriculum. In that two years of the master's program, we will teach you how to teach that area. So you can come in if you have a, you know, a history degree. We won't be teaching you history. We'll be teaching you how to teach history. So it is a pedagogically focused program. Okay, um, um, and that's something very um, important to consider. This is not about teaching you content. If you want to be a maths teacher, it's not going to teach you maths. It's going to teach you how to teach maths. Um, and I think that's important to keep your keep in mind. You can see here the specializations that we offer and you can see the combined specializations that I mentioned before. Um, and you can see that primary education here is offered at um, Peninsula and Clayton campus. And then the combined ones are offered at Clayton. If you are considering becoming a secondary school teacher, these are the current teaching areas, sometimes called methods. These are the current methods that we provide um, initial teacher education in. So you need to be able, your undergraduate needs to map to one of these specialist teaching areas. Um, and these are based on the National Australian Schools curriculum. And so we can't, um, for example, we can't train people to be graphic designers. We can't have a graphic design area um, because it's not in the national curriculum. However, the skills within your graphic design degree may map to others of these, such as media studies or the arts. So there are ways to think about it um, and you can get some personalized advice on that. Um, we'll give you some context for that, but it is important to, to note that these are the specialist areas. In primary um, education, you will choose a specialization. So you will choose to be either a math specialist, a literacy specialist or a science specialist. They, they don't have um, major uh, prerequisites as the, as these ones do but and you can choose those as you go through the program so um, all specializations have some similar um, entry requirements you need an un Australian undergrad degree or equivalent and you need to have a credit average and the reason for that is because as we said we need you to come in with the content so that we can then teach you how to teach that content. And so we need you to have had a, a successful learning experience in that content area. If you're coming in as an English as a second language, um, these are your IELTS scores uh, requirements that are asked. And you will also need to complete a situational judgment test, which uh, Jen will talk about in just a moment. There are some specific entry requirements based on the course that you choose. So you can see those here. Um, um, and as I was saying, when you look at the secondary education specialization down the bottom, you must have a major study in one secondary teaching area and a minor study in a second teaching area. So 
to become a secondary teacher in, excuse me, in an Australian school, you have to have two specializations or methods they're often called. So you might be an art and science teacher, or you might be um, a health and PE teacher or a humanities and English teacher. You need to have two. What we mean here by major and minor, I'll let Jen talk about, but it's to do with the number of um, undergraduate credit points you have in each of those specializations. To become a primary education specialist, you do need to have one year full-time study relevant to one or more learning areas of the primary curriculum. So the primary curriculum, um, it covers an awful lot. So the majority, we find the majority of people applying do have that, um, but you may have to have some discussions with people about what that actually looks like for you. Um, before I hand over to Jen, I want to mention professional experience. We have um, teacher registration and regulation in Australia. And as I mentioned, the Victorian Institute of Teaching, VIT, is the representative of our national regulation body here in Victoria. They set the minimum amount of professional experience days that people wanting to be teachers must complete. So you must complete a minimum of 60 days and we will find placements. We have a whole team um, that uh, will find you uh, a placement. You can see there the professional experience office will arrange for your um, placement. It, they will try and uh, find you something close to home or up to an hour's travel within your home, depending. Where it gets tricky for placements is if you want to specialize in um, history or humanities um, and the local schools around you don't have anyone who can take a graduate student in those areas, then we have to look further abroad. But um, most of, it's all very well arranged by the professional experience offered office um, and they will interact with you and help you work that out. Um, when you go on placement, you will need to have a working with children check um, and you'll get all of the information about how to do that, but you will need to um, successfully pass a working with children check in order to go up into the schools and engage with the staff and the teachers. The multi-layered support is referring to the professional experience office, the education success advisors that I mentioned before, and then the people on the, there's a whole team um, who will support you while you are on placement. They will visit you, they will help you with questions, um, work with you on communication or teaching strategies if needed. Um, so there's a lot of support. And in your first placement, there are different expectations for you compared to your last placement. So by we talked about the fact that there are different levels of accreditation. We want everybody in our course to reach the graduate level there are national standards you need to meet by the end of the course, but we don't expect you to meet those outcomes in your first placement. We expect you to build on them and have met all of those outcomes by the end of your last placement. So it is very much developmental. There are exciting options of where you can uh, go on placement. So you can do them locally. We have rural placements um, in the Basque Coast and I think up in Mildura. Um, and we have increasing number of international options. And next year will be Italy and Fiji, where you can do your two weeks or three weeks of placement in a school in those locations, and it will count towards your registration. That is an application process um, that not everybody who applies can go, but it is, um, it's a very exciting program you might like to consider as one of your placements. I'm gonna hand over to Jen to talk about the application process itself. Thanks so much, Joe. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jen. I am uh, part of the Faculty of Education's Future Students team. So I talk to prospective students all the time. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, before I talk about how to apply, I think Joe mentioned that I should probably also talk about what is considered a major or a minor. So I'll do that. So a major is a six unit sequence uh, in one discipline. So a major in physics, for example, because we need more physics teacher, um, is a, a six unit sequence in physics with no more than two units at level one and at least two units at level three in the area of physics. 
So all of that probably sounds really complicated. Don't worry. When you apply for the course and um, provide your transcripts, our admissions team will have a very close look at your transcript and application to determine whether you have enough content knowledge for a discipline so that you can be offered um, a method in that area. So yeah, um, just apply and then the admissions team will let you know what areas you're eligible for. Um, so how to apply, oh, and minor, sorry. Minor is a four unit sequence with no more than two units at level two, uh, sorry, level one. So a minor is um, uh, is usually what we require for most subjects. So if you wanna teach maths, for example, you need a minor sequence in maths in order to um, be able to teach that subject in a school. And how to apply. So how to apply is pretty simple. You apply directly to Monash. Uh, uh, just look up how to apply Monash University and then probably the first Google result will be the website which will take you to the um, Monash application online portal. Applications for the next intake are open now and will close on the 19th of January 2024. And if you are an international student, you will probably also need to apply for a visa to study with Monash. Um, so we encourage you to apply as early as possible to avoid any delays in visa applications and looking for accommodation, things like that, to get yourself organized. Um, and uh, international students can also apply through a Monash accredited agent. Um, you can also Google or look up on your uh, preferred uh, search engine, Monash uh, agent database. We have a website that has all the agents we, um, uh, we recognize um, at Monash, so you can go through them. And um, But you don't have to, you can totally apply directly yourself. So the situational judgment test that Joe has mentioned um, previously for the past five years, we've been using, thanks Joe, the CASPER test, which is um, a test managed and designed by a Canadian company called Acuity Insights. And that test uh, is used by multiple institutions in the world for different courses like medicine, teaching, um, dentistry, um, nursing, a lot of different courses. And that test uh, does cost money. Um, so in order to offer students more flexibility and choice, Monash University has recently, very recently introduced a new test called the M test, uh, which stands for Monash Teaching Suitability Test to assess applicants for their qualities that uh, we consider suitable for teaching. So uh, you can see on the on the slide here, there are seven characteristics that we consider essential for students to study teaching. Um, so this M test will ask you to demonstrate that you are you um, possess these qualities, and it's only fifteen minutes. Um, compared to Casper, it's definitely much shorter, and it's also free. You can also do it online um, from anywhere in the world, uh, as long as you have got a working computer and a stable internet connection. Um, so to do the test, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, you just um, need to go to a website um, and then find the link. And the link will be available for test taking every Tuesday from next week every Tuesday from next week. And on the Tuesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Melbourne time, you'll be able to um, go onto the website and do the test. Uh, remember, you have three weeks to um, get your test results processed by Monash. And also the test is for Monash applications only. So we will not share your M test results with any other institutions. So if you're applying to multiple universities, you might still have to do 
um, another test that is required by that other university. But if you're applying for Monash, you have the choice to do the M test, which is free and you can have, which is the best news, you can have three attempts during each admissions cycle. So that is a really, really good um, uh, bonus in terms of doing the M test because, um, Joe, would you mind going to the next one, please? Thank you. So, um, because compare with Casper, uh, M test allows you to do three attempts per cycle, whereas Casper allows you to do uh, the test only once when you apply for the course um, per cycle. So that can create quite a lot of anxiety uh, and makes people very nervous. So um, in order to help students along the way, help them become a great teacher, we're offering them the option to do the M test, which is free, 15 minutes only. But do remember that you have, um, that if you do the M test, the test results will be used by Monash University only. If you have completed both Casper and the M test, we will use the higher result of the two. So if you do both tests, that definitely would help maximize your chances of getting an offer. So there's no, absolutely no harm in doing both tests because we will use the better result. But if you want to save yourself $80, um, and the stress of doing a two hour test, then you're welcome to uh, not do the Casper test and just do our M test, which is free. Um, I think that is it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Jen. No um, worries. I think that the, the thing to highlight is that um, everybody can learn, but not everybody can teach. And that's kind of the, the thinking behind these um, suitability or aptitude kind of tests um, that, that there are certain um, certain approaches to life that uh, transfer well into teaching and as I said teaching um, today may not be the same experience as you had at a school I know it isn't for me um, and it is a very different um, a collaborative exciting creative student focused uh, profession where we look at individual needs and all of these things so willingness to learn um, motivation to teach self-efficacy which is um, which is connected to the idea of agency that you are able to have an impact on on what you're doing so rather than um, having a mindset that you just do what you can and they may learn or they may not learn self-efficacy and agency is more about um if that didn't work, I've got to try other things because I know I do have the potential to have impact and to help these people learn. Um, there's a number of questions that I'll let the uh, I'll let the team have a go at. Um, and while we're doing that, I'm going to invite Maya to uh, join us and talk to us a bit about her experience. Thank you, Maya. You're very welcome. Is everyone able to hear me okay? Um, okay, beautiful. All right, well, thank you very much for having me, having me tonight, Joe, Patrick, and Jen. As um, as the, as what was introduced, I'm Maya Kawashima. Uh, I graduated from Monash in January of 2018, and since then, I have been working at um, at Wesley College this year as a French teacher in secondary school. And prior to this, I was at Woodley School in Mornington Peninsula, where I taught French and VC business management for five years. So my teaching methods at Monash were French and EAL. And I remember by my first day at Monash, I was very excited. I remember being extremely invigorated by the course that was being taught. I remember my, I remember my first lecture, which was learning at the heart of teaching, which was um, coordinated and, um, and lectured by Mark Phillips. I remember being extremely invigorated, um, excited by you know, by the energy and, and the buzz that was uh, felt around the room. I definitely felt that I had made the right decision when I came to Monash and thinking, yes, it is so exciting to learn the content and to be able to apply it in, in real life context. And Joe, I completely agree with you that the teaching experience these days is quite different to when I was in high school. And I definitely attest to what you were saying earlier as well about the importance of collaboration. And in my speech today, I will be talking about how collaboration is, um, is fostered and occurs on a day-to-day -day basis. 
So before teaching, over uh, six years and earlier, so before teaching, I was in the corporate sector and I worked in this in the fields of sales and marketing and in finance. And I did that for about a total of five years. But I always felt that I had a yearning to be a teacher. In fact, French is one of my life's biggest passions. And I knew that I wanted to be a French teacher. So in 2012, I left my previous corp my previous corporate profession and I studied both French, uh, sorry, graduate diploma of French and master of teaching in order to become a high school French teacher. And what attracted me about Monash University? Well, first of all, I remember attending the information session back in May of 2015. And what really struck me about the Monash University's um, lecture and the information session was how, um, how approachable the lecturers and the presenters were. You know, they provided the information in such a bite-sized chunk and I felt really confident that this was the university that I wanted to go to. And what I also liked about Monash, as what, as what was alluded um, and has been mentioned, is that, yes, it is number one teaching profession, uh, sorry, teaching, uh, teaching um, course, you know, in Australia and 14th in the world. So that's a huge testament to the wonderful work that the lecturers, the tutors and the research professionals invest into this course. And in addition to this, I really enjoyed um, the, the close links, you know, that Monash has to so many schools. And as what Joe mentioned earlier, I have also had the privilege of, um, of having three different professional placements in various school settings. So I myself have very fond memories of my time at Monash. And what I, what I can definitely attest to my time there is that yes, there is a close link between what is, uh, what is taught in theory and applying that to real life context. I know, for example, with, uh, with, with what I have learnt, yes, uh, we learnt about the importance of, um, of, dif of differentiating, which basically means that, yes, you know, you are meant to teach the content, but making sure that all students, irrespective of their needs and, and abilities, are able to access that information in a way that makes sense to them. And definitely, um, it is all about using different, uh, different methodologies and, uh, and facilitating your you know, your teaching so that all students are able to understand your lessons. And this is actually also where technology comes in as well, so that, you know, you, you know that you become really adept at using different software, different, um, yeah, different programs, you know, to, to make learning fun and engaging as well. And this is also something that, that Monash University's uh, degree really focused on as well. You know, how to, um, how to, how to have that, that sense of, um, of, excitement in learning, you know, um, ensuring that students are there because they want to be there um, and you know, and making sure, you know, that your lesson ties in with that. So I, I have so many fond memories of courses that I have studied at Monash, which, uh, yeah, which looked at contemporary teaching methodologies, which tied in, you know, with, uh, with modern uh, teaching practices and yes, you know, th that are supported by best practices. What I also really liked about Monash was um, how approachable, as I mentioned earlier, how approachable the lecturers and the tutors were. I know that when I had my 32 assignments to write in total, uh, there were times where I thought, okay, I'm not really sure exactly where I'm going with this assignment. Um, so I would go and see my tutors or lecturers beforehand. And they were always so willing to spend the time going through with you and saying, yes, you are on the right track. Or perhaps you might need to you know, fine tune your area in, in this research or this learning. So I really take my hat off to, you know, the professionalism and also the, you know, the approach, the approachableness of the lecturers and tutors. And coming back to the, the point of collaboration, this happens on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, exactly as what Joe mentioned, collaboration happens not only between the teachers and amongst um, the teachers and, and the students, but also, yes, within within the, the school community and the wider community. Yes, you know, some of my days now and in my previous um, job involved um, contacting parents, let them know if, um, if there were ways, you know, that I could help support their, their child's learning needs or how I can, how I can make the content, um, um, I guess, more accessible to them. But at the same time, sharing good news with parents as well, which is always really lovely. So working, yeah, working closely, um, you know, within that partnership, definitely uh, fosters fosters what we do. And again, what, what, Monash, what the Monash University degree teaches us is that, yes, it is all about having that close partnership between us as teachers 
and um, and the wider community. So yes, I have many fond memories of my of my time there. And in fact, one of the one of the course that that particularly resonated with me was um, was the concept of called um, the universal de design of learning, which is based on a uh, similar to differentiation. It's about developing a flexible learning environment where information is presented in multiple ways. So yes, this is absolutely important so that the information is transmitted um, and broken down to all students, irrespective of, um, of, their, of their learning needs and where they're at. I agree with you completely, Joe. that yes, these days it is about how we teach. So I agree with you that you might, you know, you might learn to you know, specialize to become a math teacher or a French teacher for that matter, but you're not, you're not learning how to be a teacher per se, you're learning how to teach and to teach it effectively. So, you know, in my, in my, dis, you know, in my discipline of French, we also incorporate various subjects. So what I like about the Monash University's course is that nothing is taught in isolation. And in fact, um, yeah, various subjects all come together, which makes uh, makes more sense to you know to everyone involved. So my master of teaching course at Monash, yes, it involved the fifteen days of professional learning per semester, and I was fortunate to have worked at three different schools and building you know that positive rapport with um yeah with the mentors on my placements. Um, I know in my very first teaching placement, I was given the opportunity to teach Japanese and EAL, but I put up my hand and I said, is it okay if I teach business management? That's not my method, but I have had industry experience and my mentor was more than happy to, you know, to, to help out with his year 11 students for that, which I'm absolutely grateful for. And as what was mentioned earlier um, in this lecture, yes, you will be provided with, uh, with a professional education officer who will make sure that everything is fine on your placement, just to make sure that you as a pre-service teacher are given the guidance and the support to help you uh, with your, with your uh, professional placements. So as I was, as I was um, you know, nearing graduation of my, of my degree, I, was, I still had two months left before I applied for my role at Woodley, uh, Woodley School. And I was a little bit concerned thinking, oh, but I don't have my full VIT registration. So what happens is a lot of schools, when, you know, when they advertise for their roles, they do say that, yes, you do need a full VIT registration uh, beforehand. I myself did not have this because as I said, I still had two months left of my, of my degree left. But what was, uh, what was great was that I was able to apply for what is called a, a permission to teach, which provides you with a leeway to teach in the schools, even if you have not fully finished your degree. So in my case, I was absolutely fortunate to have had the permission, permission to teach, which allowed me to teach uh, at the school with two months left of my degree. So looking back, my first year of teaching uh, was both rewarding and challenging. And I say challenging in the sense that yes, you know, you, you hit the ground running. There was a lot of work to do, a lot of lesson planning, a lot of marking. I remember spending my first year basically every weekend I was lesson planning and marking. And at times I thought, oh, this is, this is, you know, this is actually quite challenging. What I was so thankful for back then and even today is the amount of support that I got from fellow teachers around me. And in fact, I had two veteran teachers who taught me that it's not necessarily about how hard you work, but it's also about how smart you work. So let me explain. What I mean by this is, yes, the first couple of years, from my experience, have been challenging in terms of, um, in terms of manage, managing the workload, in terms of managing the, the demands of, um, of teaching. But what was, what was great was that over time, you learn to become more efficient with your time. You say, okay, this lesson plan worked really, really well. And yes, exactly as what Joe said earlier, whilst I might not use that exactly uh, same lesson in the future, I can still use that PowerPoint or that resource to perhaps fine tune it or to improve it for next time. So over time, you know, you build your, your resources, which makes it easier uh, for you to teach that same subject in the future. And yeah, learning to, learning to um, be smarter with my time and also, also self-care became important as well. I think in my first year, I thought the harder I work and the longer I work, the better it will be. Uh, but 
the, the esteemed and uh, veteran colleagues said to me, no, 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 that's not how it works. <laughs> uh, treat teaching sometimes as a, as a mar as like a marathon. You know, it's a sometimes, you know, the road can be long, but it's about you know, stopping and looking after yourself whilst also taking, um, yeah, ta taking stock, um, taking, yeah, taking breaks where you need, but also um, keep yourself going with the support of those around you. So I'm really thankful to the, you know, to the support that I had um, at that time. And coming back to collaboration. So as we all know, COVID hit in 2020 and that definitely shaped up how we taught. So I remember at Woodley, we were immediately uh, required you know, to teach students using, um, using Teams and Zoom. Now we hadn't taught like this before, you know, uh, where students, you see 30 students on your screen and you are trying to teach a lesson remotely. What I really appreciate about that time was how resilient all my students were. Um, sure, I understand that um, taking classes in this remote context might not have been appealing to all students, but they all, you know, they all they all got up every morning, they all attended the lectures um, and, and the classes, they handed in their assignments, they were learning. So to them, I took my hat off. And so I have, yeah, I do have a lot of a lot of fond memories in terms of um, my six years of teaching. It's been, uh, yeah, it's been up and uh, it's been up and down in the sense that yes, you've had to learn to fine tune what you do, but it was great to have all that support around me. So for that, I'm absolutely thankful. And to wrap it up, I highly recommend the Master of Teaching at Monash. It is a world class education, and uh, which is taught by some of the sharpest minds in the education sector. As mentioned, um, you know, I was fortunate to have worked with some extremely knowledgeable and, um, and professional, but at the same time, approachable tutors and lecturers as well, who were very um, generous in sharing their knowledge with me. So for that, I'm absolutely thankful. And I can definitely attest that the courses that I have learned at Monash have, um, have definitely transformed and um, yeah, transformed me as a teacher and that they have all, um, they have all been absolutely practical in the teaching sense. Well, thank you very much for your time and I'll pass you back to you, Joe. Thanks, Maya. Um, really appreciate you being here tonight and, um, and it's always wonderful to hear success stories from our programs. We are always evaluating and reviewing our programs as well so that we can maintain that quality uh, going forwards. Um, I guess one, one little thing to add is that um, the vast majority of our staff have been classroom teachers um, at some point in their career. Um, and so we do have a very strong understanding of the day-to-day -day in a school, um, but we also very highly value the theoretical understanding of how teaching should happen, how learning can happen and those things. And we seek to kind of have that balance. Um, Thank you very much um, again, Maya. So we're going to move on to um, some questions. Um, and Jen, I might just ask you if there's any general themes in the question, in the Q&A that you'd like to address. But what, before you do that, I want to put this up on the screen because this is what you need to take a screenshot or a photo of, um, because this is how you get um, your queries answered. I know in the Q&A, a lot of people are providing their unique circumstances. And obviously it's very hard in a webinar like this to give you a yes, that's eligible, no, that's not. So going through the information presented here on the screen will um, help you get more personalized answers. But Jen, what's been happening in the Q&A? A lot of questions about the M-Test, given that it's new. We announced it last week. So, yeah, definitely lots of questions about that. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, quite a lot of questions, uh, Joe, about eligibility. So if I've got this qualification and this work experience, can I apply? Um, mm -hmm. I'll answer the eligibility question first. So if you meet the minimum entry requirements, we definitely encourage you to apply. Um, and the admissions team will look at your transcripts, your documentation to see if they need any further information. But um, to apply for the course, you don't need work experience. We uh, rank applicants purely based on your academic performance. So uh, make sure you submit your up-to-date transcripts. And um, you also need to meet the minimum English language requirements plus the uh, situational judgment test requirement, which could be Casper or the M-Test, or you can do both to maximize your chances. Cool. 
Um, mm. Joe, do you mind if I answer some of the questions? No, please do. Uh, yeah, in the Q and A, we've already we've already answered sixty three by typing. Um, Great. And yeah, there's uh, eighteen left in the chat. Well done. Well um, done. <laughs> yeah, but um, before I do that, I probably asked uh, my Maya to answer. Uh, there was a question about how many days are you expected on campus as a full-time student um, and how many contact hours per week. Apologies if you have already addressed that in your... Okay, no, no, not a problem. So from <laughs> so from my memory, the uh, how many days a week, uh, it really it really depended on, on, on the subject and also the semesters because I remember the semesters uh, varied in terms of how many days um, I was at I was at university. But from my memory, on average, I was there for about three days per week. Um, and the contact hour from my memory was about, Lucy's going a, a little while back, it's about, it was about 12 to you know, 12 to 15 hours a week um, because it was basically you know, one hour of lecture and also two hours of tutorial per subject. So it was about, yeah, yeah it's about 12, yeah, 12 hours per week. Having said that, though, even though it was a 12 contact hour per week, um, I would say half of that, sorry, um, you know, the, the same amount of that was also spent on researching, doing assignments and studying outside the, uh, the course as well. So, have, yeah, so what that meant was that if it was a 12 contact hour per week, I basically gave myself <clears throat> 24, content, 24 hours to, you know, attend the universe, attend the courses uh, and also doing some, you know, doing some study as well. Mm. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, and uh, Parth asked, uh, there are no exams whatsoever? No, true. There is. There are no exams. <laughs> yeah, no exams in the course, um, but we do... Um, want to remind everybody that um, to register as a teacher, you do need to complete um, the LANTIT, which is the National Literacy and Numeracy Test for teacher education students. That is uh, applicable to all teacher education courses in Australia. So that is something you do in your course once you are enrolled. And uh, we have a team that is dedicated to supporting students to do the tests. You'll be provided with sample tests. And we've heard from students that a lot of the sample questions that you will receive from um, our team would actually be quite similar to the real test. So lots of support for students to pass their land height. Yeah, which is a which is a, a requirement of registration. So you can't actually qualify and finish your course as a teacher until you pass both the literacy and numeracy land types. Jen, yeah. if you don't mind, I'm just going to jump in and jump on the back sure. of what Maya was saying, because Maya um, has been teaching for a number of years. The courses have changed a little bit since then, of course. So um, what you can do is you can Google Monash University Education Courses Maps, and it will tell you what units of study or what subjects you would be studying full-time or part-time each semester. And for each subject, we say, so you, you probably do four subjects a semester plus your placement. Um, and for each of those subjects, we rec the, the idea is you, you, you assign 140 hours over the semester for each of those um units or subjects so you might take an introduction to literacy and that might have three hours of teaching a week and we don't have lectures anymore Maya had them but we don't have them anymore so that will be three hours of workshops or lectures um, but then across the semester you would expect to work for 140 hours in addition on top of those three contact hours mm -hmm. per week and that 140 would be accorded to each of those four units that you would be studying so it is an intense course it is mm -hmm. um it is a professional qualification. And so we are internally accredited at the university and externally credited by the national body as well. Um, and so there are certain requirements. Someone mentioned in the Q&A, why is it a two year program? It used to be a one year. Yeah, you used to be able to do a graduate diploma, but the national standards um, came in about 12 years ago now. And everyone who wants to be a teacher either needs a four year undergraduate or a two year master's program. So that is the same everywhere in Australia now. Thanks, Joe. Um, uh, just on land height, because we just cover that, um, do early childhood specialization students also have to do the exam? So the answer is no. If you are specializing in early childhood education alone, that is 
not early childhood and primary education specialization because we do have that dual sector um, course. Uh, if you're just doing early childhood, you don't have to do Lantite or CASPER or the M-Test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah so that's right. really no exam for you if you're doing early childhood. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah, and the M-Test, um, so students ask, do they need to study for it? Like CASPER, you know, do I have to prepare? The M test is pretty straightforward, only 15 minutes. Um, so you don't need to study for it, but we do recommend that you find a, yourself a quiet place where you won't be disturbed to do the test so you can focus. Uh, and once you start the test, you won't be able to take a break until you finish. So yeah, make sure you have your, you found a place where you can sit the test undisturbed for 15 minutes. And um, yeah, just um, be yourself and try to maximize the time that you have, the 15 minutes. So you don't need to prepare too much for it. Um, yeah, the instructions will be given to you at the start of the M-test, so they should be sufficient. Um, but remember, if you didn't meet the requirement at the first attempt, you still have two additional attempts for the um, same intake right um, right yeah someone asked um anonymous um audience member asked are there any advantages for having combined specializations versus a single specialization yeah so i think the the answer to that is um we find that people who do the the dual specialization um, either have not yet quite decided if they would prefer to be a primary or a secondary teacher or those who want to have maximum flexibility throughout their career. So with that um, dual specialization, which you complete in the two years, you would be able to work for, say, two years in a primary school and then go and work in a secondary school and then go back to a primary school. So you can actually move between the sectors. So if that's the kind of flexibility you, you think you would enjoy, the dual specialization, or if you're not sure um, whether which context you prefer. So primary schools are, are often quite different um, as a teacher than secondary schools. So if you're not quite sure where you'd like to teach yet, um, that is a, another reason for um, looking at the dual specialization. Mm. So it really gives you flexibility and choice. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. Right. Mm. Um, and um, some questions about how application systems work. So um, students are asking, how long do I have to wait before I know I have an offer or not, which is a very, very good question. So um, this year, we are doing rolling offers um, as opposed to we have a cutoff date and then everyone will be ranked um, during that time. So this year we're actually um, giving our students about three to four weeks time before we notify them whether they have um, received an offer or not. So how it works is you put in your application online and make sure you have all the documentation ready uh, or as much as you can. Um, and then the admissions team will tell you if you need any further uh, to submit any further documentation. And if you're applying for a course um, uh, that is not single early childhood specialization, you still you do need to do the M test. Um, or or the Casper test, or you can do both. And ha when we recommend you to do it is when you have applied for the course. So after you apply for the course, uh, if you're not a Monash student already, within about 48 hours, you should receive in your email um, your Monash student ID number. And you will be using that number to uh, do your M test or Casper test. Um, so it takes about three weeks for M-Test or CASPER res, um, test results to be processed. So um, that's why we say apply for the course and then do the M-Test or CASPER shortly after that so that there won't be any delays with your offer processing because uh, it takes about three weeks for us to know the results. So once we have everything ready within three weeks, um, three to four weeks of your applying for the course, you should know whether you have a place or not. And we highly encourage you to apply early. Um, so yeah, we the number of places is limited. So we recommend that you apply as early as possible. Um, an anonymous question 
Um, can some placements be completed interstate? Um, the short answer is yes, uh, but there are some limitations to that. So if you are doing an interstate placement, more likely is um, that you have to look for that opportunity yourself because our uh, placement network is predominantly based in uh, Victoria. Um, so yet yeah, you have to source those placement opportunities yourself and then the faculty will assess whether that organization meets the requirement because we need to make sure there is a suitable mentor teacher there um, in that school or early childhood um, organization who can look after you. Yeah. Joe, do you want to add anything to that one? No, no, I think that's good. Um, so, so one, just building on that, someone did, I did notice a question about, mm -hmm. can you do your placement in um, a, an organization where you are currently working? Um, the, the kind of the short answer is yes and no. Um, you may be able to do one of your placements there, but part of the registration requirements um, mean that you need a diverse experience across different contexts. So you you may you will also need to go to other contexts um, just to avoid any kind of bias um, in evaluations and things like that. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a question about the course content, which I think, Joe, you'll be the best person to answer. Mm -hmm. um, so if I am a music teacher and someone else is a PE teacher, do we address our own specialties in assessments or is it more generalized content to cater for everybody? Yeah, so I'd encourage you to have a look at the course maps. So again, just Google Monash University Education course maps and you'll see that um, you'll have what's called method subjects. So mm -hmm. in the first year you'll have, there are a number of uh, units. The majority of the units are for all specializations. So you'll do, for example, um, a unit on assessment, and then you'll do a, uh, a unit on inclusion and diversity, or a unit on Indigenous and First Nations cultures. Um, and they apply across all of the different specializations. But you will have one year of uh, teaching in your method so if you're going to be a French teacher like Maya and like I was too by the way um, the then you will have uh, semester one in your first year and semester two in your first year you will have uh, two units that will introduce you to how to teach those specific methods because the strategies we use to teach French are different to the strategies we use to teach PE or science or history. There are unique pedagogies to each method. So the, the you'll see in the course maps that you, you'll see methods 1A and methods 2A, I think it's usually listed as, um, yeah. and, and go through. And then you also get, if you have two methods, if you're doing a major and a minor, you'll get uh, teaching in those areas as well. Great. Thanks, Joe. Mm -hmm. um, someone asked, will having a, a Master of Teaching degree make me more employable than having a Bachelor of Education honours? I think that's a very good question. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting. With the teacher demand at the moment, um, it, it, it probably doesn't um, really impact. But in the longer term, it means you have um, a higher level of qualification. Um, if you want in five, 10 years time to look at going into uh, leadership, for example, having a master's um, is, is a really good thing to have. It, um, we offer masters of teaching, which is a qualifying degree to become a registered teacher. We also offer the master of education, which is for anyone. So it could be someone who works in the math department who wants to understand how people learn, not to become a teacher. And so with a master of teaching you can then do a master of education master of education in a specialized area as someone was asking but um the benefit in the short term um is the shorter program to get you into the classroom because you already have content knowledge from your undergraduate degree um and then in the longer term having a master's um sets you a little bit above everybody else if you're going for things like promotions um, because the master's does require that next level of thinking and deduction deduction and uh, critical thinking and those kind of ideas um, as you would expect compared to an undergraduate program thanks joe uh, a couple more questions about the m test um, results so when uh, does the result expire and the answer is yes it's uh only valid 
per cycle. So if you're applying for 2024 and you've set the M-test three times already, then your best result will be used for that intake, for 2024 intake. And if you want to um, start the course in 2025 instead, um, either you get an offer from us for 2024 and then you can defer for 12 months or you have to apply for the course again the following year, which means that you do have to sit the M test again. Uh, but if you defer, you don't need to um, do the test again. And can I do it before I finish my bachelor's degree? Depending on when you apply for the master of teaching, if you're applying in your final semester, um, then yeah, you can do the M test um, during your bachelor's degree. But um, yeah, like I said, do it once you have applied for the course, not, not long after, shortly after, like within a week or two, so that we can get on to your result as quickly as possible and um, issue you an offer if you met all the other requirements. Um, yeah, and the M test requirement. And if you didn't meet the MTES requirement uh, within three weeks, then you, you will find out and then you will know, oh, I can have another go. Um, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So think of it as the application must come first. So you're in the system and then the M test is an appendix to that. So it needs to come afterwards. Um, and so you're adding adding that to your application um, as one of the other prerequisites that you need to have. Um, Let's have a look. There's a number of questions um, about people's particular circumstances. And it's really exciting to see um, the range of people that are interested in becoming teachers. So it's, it's wonderful, these sessions. Um, all this experience that could potentially come, be coming into our schools is just really exciting. You, um, I really advise you to use this QR code on the screen and book a call with the Faculty of Education. So that's um, Jen and her team will be able to help with that. Um, and you will get specific uh, feedback. OK, they might ask you to some, submit some paperwork or your transcripts and get back to you. But that's your first port of call. Um, all of the other requirements are on those links that you can see on the screen as well. So you can either call up or um, and ask. To speak to someone about that or you can go to that link online um other yeah other uh, uh, yeah still lots of questions uh like you said joe about um individual circumstances um and yeah we highly recommend that you book a call with us but uh ultimately we cannot advise on your eligibility until you have applied for the course until we have seen your transcript um, and know your circumstances so um, I understand that you have burning questions about whether I meet the requirement or not but unfortunately we do need to see your documentation and your application to be able to advise you on that um, there's a question about placement uh, in the early childhood education specialization do placements run during regular teaching week or will it happen during the holidays? So so that's tricky because teaching and holidays can refer to the schools that you're going to go out to <laughs> or the university. So um, your placement is your placement where we send you out to a school occurs during the university semester. Um, so we have 12 week semesters and you'll have, um, you know, three weeks of placement within that 12 weeks. Um, and then we have, uh, depending on the program, if you're doing the accelerated course, you might just keep rolling. Um, but if you're doing the full time course, then you would have the mid year gap and then start semester two. Um, so the holidays, obviously, the, the placements can't occur during school holidays because there'd be no one to teach. Um, so you will go out during your 12 weeks of university semester. Part of that 12 weeks will be your placement. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Joe. I have also. Um shared that um, a placement calendar with the student who asked the question, but I will put the link in the uh, chat for everyone to see. So that's the 2024 placement calendar. Mm -hmm. Students can have um, a look and get a sense of what are the dates uh, look like, what the dates will look like uh, if you start the course next year for placements. Yeah. Jen, I've noticed there's a couple of questions about pathways to further research study. So sure, high please. degree research. So PhD. So this is the this is a qualifying program to become a teacher. It does not have a major research component built in because it is an accredited uh, teaching 
registration course. So this master's does not have a pathway to the PhD. If you're interested in a PhD um, and you don't want to work in a school um, or be a registered teacher, then the master of education may be the better way. Um, and there, or the, there's the master of philosophy, the MPhil, which provides you with enough research. You have to have some research background to get into a PhD program. So um, we do have a six months uh, research certificate that you can you can apply for. That's very separate to the master of teaching. That's kind of how you get onto the um, the PhD pathway. So you either come in with research experience in your background at a higher at a master's level, and you take that into um, your application straight into PhD, or you do a master's of education or an MPhil with a major research focus and take that into PhD. Or you stick with the MTeach, the Master of Teaching, which is a qualifying for the classroom, doesn't have the research focus that you would need to get you into a PhD program. Thanks, Joe. Um, someone asked about, um, sorry, my mind just went blank because there's so many questions to get through. I know, great <laughs> questions. Um, there was a question about about um I think it was it was a question from Maya um oh yes working while studying any tips about that oh, mm. okay working while studying so I guess if the question's about um you know what sort of work um, I would recommend while studying so during my time when I was studying my master of teaching and also doing my graduate diploma in French I was tutoring for, uh, students in French, um, doing some private tutoring, you know, ranging from primary school students to secondary and VC students and adults. And I found that when I was um, especially tutoring students in secondary schools, because I knew I want to work in secondary schools, I found that, you know, tutoring students um, in secondary schools gave me a good understanding of the curriculum, you know, that the students, um, you know, had um, in, in each different school settings. And, um, and I could see... Um, you know, what the contemporary teaching methods were and also what the work the students were doing, which gave, me, which gave me a really good grounding of, I suppose, you know, how I could teach in the future. So that's one that's one role that I recommend, um, you know, in, be, in being a tutor for the subject that you plan on teaching. But having said that, I mean, I believe, you know, that all, um, all jobs and all, um, yeah, all work is, is highly transferable, um, you know, in teaching, especially when it comes to, say, customer service roles, problem solving roles, you know, the ability to work under pressure. Um, I know that when I apply for, for the roles um, at, um, at Wesley and also at Woodley, yeah, they really valued um, the previous work experience that I had. Um, but having said that, I mean, yeah, any, I would say any, any work, like, you know, casual part-time work, tutoring work, um, all those sorts of work, um, you know, where you can demonstrate, you know, your ability to, you know, to work with children, uh, but also, you know, work in, in a school environment, um, they would all um, highly benefit you. Yeah, that's right. And that, that's right. And so there are um, people we understand and a lot of the, a lot of um, a percentage of people that do the Master of Teaching are career changes, as Maya herself noted. Um, and so we do understand that people have financial commitments. Um, it is a full time course. So that is something to take into consideration. We are undergoing a review at the moment to look at how we can accommodate people's uh, working and caring commitments, but that won't um, impact next year's program. Someone asked if they're online program. Um, we don't offer online and that's because we very strongly believe that teaching is an interpersonal career and that the, the program needs to reflect that collaboration, that face-to-face -face work. Um, and so it is a fully in-person uh, program. Almost coming to the end, Jen, is there anything you wanted to bring up? last or Maya is there anything you wanted to add um I was just going to say um I guess you know what particularly resonated um you know for me about you know the course tonight is that um yeah you know that teaching has changed um you know for yeah from when I was a student and it's just so wonderful you know to see how how you know how teaching and also the education um sector continues you know to evolve um you know in line you know with contemporary teaching practices you know yeah this is something that I see you know in my own teaching practice every day um, and that's underpinned, you know, by yeah, by the Monash's um, education um, degree as well. Thanks, Wonderful. Maya. Thank you, Maya. Uh, Joe, I just posted the course map link into the okay. chat so everyone can have a look.
yeah so there's two links there that you should um, open and bookmark one is the courses is the placement calendar so obviously they're just indicative they're this year's but they happen at a similar time each year um, so you'll see when those placements come they are unpaid placements because they are towards a registration um, as a teacher so that is something uh, someone's asked um, I think the the majority of the other questions are about um, individual uh, mm. situations. So right. yeah, so mm -hmm. I very much use the QR code on your screen and get in touch and the team will be waiting to answer your questions. Yeah, uh, we do have four minutes, Joe. I'm happy to oh, go great. through a few more if you don't. Fabulous, great, great. <laughs> um, that saves people booking a call, um, sure. but feel free to still book the call. Um, uh, someone asked about, um, uh, I studied two semesters of Master of Education at Monash. Does it help shorten my Master of Teaching course to duration? The answer is no, because the two courses are very different. As Joe mentioned, the Master of Teaching is a qualifying degree. So it's a professional degree. It will qualify you to be a teacher, whereas the Master of Education, um, it, it's not a teacher education degree. So the content uh, is vastly different. It wouldn't shorten your course duration. You still have to do two years or if you're doing secondary education, one and a half years, but it would definitely give you a good foundation to the education discipline uh, and the sector. But uh, it doesn't shorten your study duration, no. Um, can I apply from master of teaching in my last semester of the bachelor yes you don't have to wait until you have graduated if you will get your uh, final results the end of this year or early next year in january we um you can definitely apply you don't need to wait until you get your final results but uh what we do is we will consider you for a conditional offer first and once you um have provided with uh, provided us with your final transcripts from your entire degree, we will see whether we can change the conditional offer into a full offer. So you do need to meet all the requirements to receive a full offer, but you can apply before you have got your results um, to get a conditional offer first. Uh, can we take up in-house English program offered by Monash to offset the uh, arts requirement? The answer is yes, yes. Um, Monash uh, College does offer Monash English program that will help you meet the Monash uh, Master of Teaching English requirement. There are 10 week blocks available depending on how uh, your current English level. We will let you know how many 10 weeks, uh, 10 week blocks you need to undertake. So that's why we encourage students to apply early in case you do need to do English uh, language programs with Monash College. Yeah. Um, someone asks, I'm quite interested in early childhood teaching. Is this specialization worth it? Joe, do you want to answer yes, that? Yes, it is. Early childhood <laughs> teaching is fantastic. Um, it is an education program in Australia for three-year-olds and four-year-olds. It is not um, It is not childcare. It is a very different qualification. It is theory-based. It has a lot of the same conceptual um, ideas behind it as the primary and secondary program do. Um, and there is also a separate national body that accredits um, early childhood teachers. So it is very much um, worth it. It is a very exciting and rewarding career. I taught in early childhood in France for a couple of years, um, and that was very exciting um, and I learned a lot from it that then helped me teaching in primary and secondary so you if you're not sure you may want to consider early childhood and primary to give you that flexibility across the two sectors um, and there is, there are um, consistencies across teaching four-year-olds and five six seven-year-olds um, but early childhood to uh, primary enables you to teach from birth up to uh, 12 year olds. Um, but the thing to bear in mind is that we do have a structured education program. It's not called a curriculum, but there are um, the guidelines and the standards that um, early childhood teachers must ensure they meet um, as um, in those programs that they run. It is also very highly in demand, particularly in Victoria at the moment. So if you're looking for um, 
looking at the employment opportunities, early childhood um, has a lot of potential um, currently. Absolutely, Joe. Um, the Victorian government has made uh, childcare free for every three and four year olds in the state. So that will create more than 6,000 new jobs in the early childhood uh, sector. So we have a lot of demand, so it's definitely worth it. Uh, I think that's all the time we have. I think so. We've got to the end. We've got to the end. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Thank you very much, everybody, for being here. We um, were just over 100 participants at one point, which is very exciting. I very warmly invite you to consider applying. Put yourself forward, um, talk to the team, figure out if this is the right course for you, um, and hopefully we can welcome you at Monash soon. Um, Maya, what are your words of wisdom for people thinking about whether they want to be teachers? I would say definitely go for it um, in the sense that, you know, if you have the drive and the passion um, and, yeah, and, and the willingness, you know, to work with young people to, you know, to impart your knowledge and also, you know, your, you know, your skill sets, you know, to the, yeah, to the younger generation. Yeah, definitely, um, definitely be worth it. Also, the other thing is, you know, as much as, as much as, you, as much as you're teaching your students, you're also learning from them as well. Uh, every day, every day is, um, every day is, is a blessing in the sense that I'm always learning from my students. Wonderful. Thank you, Maya. Jen, do you want to finish off with any housekeeping? I'll put up the, the last slide. Thank you, um, Joe. Yes, I uh, also wanted to thank Maya for your time and your yeah. generous, generous sharing of your experience and tips. Um, I, my final um, call to action <laughs> will be to apply for the course um, and the admissions team will let you know if you met the entry requirements or if you need to um, provide us with further documentation. And remember, uh, if you're applying for primary or secondary education, you do need to do a situational judgment test, which could be CASPER or the new M test, which is much shorter and free, um, or you could do both um, so that we can look at both and take the better result. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time. Good luck with your application. And we hope to see you at Monash very soon. <laughs> Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Joe. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Thank you, Maya. Thanks, Appreciate thanks, Patrick. Your time. Very welcome. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Lovely. Bye. Bye.